obviously I think it was only earlier this year that you were you know doing the press for creep for uh, creep show season two and here we are already on series three how are you uh, how are you feeling I'm feeling great you know the 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 challenge was in the middle of filming season two Shutter and AMC said hey these episodes are turning out really well do you got any more scripts in your pocket and we sort of jumped right into season three so it's it's a little unique to know that we shot 12 episodes and then we split them into two different seasons so I just am still working on finalizing some of the comic book elements and animation elements for uh, for season three, and we start airing uh, shortly. So, if you know, Creep Show's been, it's pro it's been a, a full year for me of of writing and doing the animated special and the holiday special, and then season two and now season three, while I'm doing Walking Dead and developing other shows as well. So. Uh, yeah, catching my breath. You weren't one of the people that got to, you know, sit at home and uh, practice their banana bread recipe. Oh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, like, you know, you're very busy and, you know, on the creep show, you know, you wear many hats. You know, obviously, the, you know, the, the big one of those is that, you know, you're a showrunner of the uh, the program. Um, so I guess that means, obviously, you know, you're reading all the scripts and things. You know, what what is it? Uh, you know, how do you decide? You know, which scripts you're going to make and then also how you're going to pair them up because obviously there tends to be you know, two stories per, per episode. Well you know in terms of the choosing the scripts you know we we get a lot of submissions and I I went back to a lot of the writers from season one who I felt had the right sensibility um, and you know, in a lot of instances, I would read a story and, and think to myself, oh, I want to direct this one. I want to make this one. And that sort of puts it on the top of the pile of things that I'm going to submit to the network. And I think that's kind of, you know, I feel like I really kind of got my, my feet under me for season two in terms of choosing stories that were not only personal to me, but paid, but paid tribute to the genre, you know, that was uh, you know, there's a, a, a Sam Raimi uh, sort of tribute episode with Public Television of the Dead. And then we had um, Night Living Late Show with Justin Long. And so I was I really felt like I kind of I started getting a lot more confidence in in the stories that I was choosing and the style of filmmaking. And so in terms of the pairing, it's challenging because a lot of times we don't pair the episodes the way they're shot we we pair the episodes to, for production in terms of blocking them like okay well these two episodes are on stage these two episodes have to go out and shoot on location these two, so it's it's very different what we what we usually end up doing is once all the episodes are cut together um we start looking at like okay well what do we want to open the show with and and in terms of tone i like to mix tones i don't want two episodes that are both a little more tongue in cheek to be in the same episode. I wanna, I wanna switch them up a little bit so that every time you watch an episode of Creepshow, you get a different experience. And it makes you, you know, wanna come back and watch more because you're like, oh, that was fun. I didn't expect this, I didn't expect that. So pairing them up is, is usually a lot of sort of seeing how the episodes turned out and looking at the tone of each one and then and then figuring out like the journey of the season, which is very different than most TV shows that have a very structured episodic nature. You know, we have a little bit of freedom, a little bit of opportunity to play, you know. I mean, the show is also quite, uh, you know, it's quite famous for, you know, popping up with the, you know, the occasional familiar face, you know, of, uh, who have you got sort of, uh, in your pocket for this series? Well, for, for season three, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of the actors that I, that I had a chance to, to work with are people that I had worked with in the past. And when we were doing season two, Michael Rooker and I had been talking and I wanted Michael for an episode and he couldn't do it because he was off shooting Fantasy Island in Thailand. He was shooting another movie. So I got Michael Rooker to start an episode with Reed Scott, uh, who I was a, a big fan of from Veep. Uh, I have Hannah Fearman, who is now directing a movie. She, she's done a lot of great 
uh, genre work. And uh, our first episode has Ethan Embry. Uh, and Ethan and I met on The Walking Dead. He came in as, as a, a guest star for one episode. And, you know, they, the, the, the idea was they were trying to set him up like he was going to be this new sort of, you know, main part of the ensemble cast. And he gets killed in the first episode that he's in. So I directed him in that episode and bit his face, he got his face bitten off by a zombie. Well, who doesn't? Um, so I reached out to him and he came and he came and did, uh, he came and did an episode with us. And so I really feel fortunate that the actors that I've had the, the good fortune of collaborating with want to keep working with me. You know, I guess I'm, you know, doing something right because they're, they're willing to come back, so. And I mean, I think uh, the, the two stories that, that I've seen from season three that you've directed, um, Queen Bee and Skeletons in the Closet, um, you know, they both sort of share a common theme of, of fandom, um, but they're very, they're very different takes on on that. You know, what was it about those scripts that, that spoke to you and made you want to have a start? Well, Queen, Queen Bee, I really liked, and, and honestly, a lot of what I liked about it, it was two things. One of them was it was really geared towards it was a more modern tale, you know, it's got a younger, you know, it's got a teen uh, vibe to it. And, you know, when I was growing up, so many of the horror movies in the in the 70s had, it was teenagers, teenagers doing something stupid, teenagers finding themselves in a situation, they don't know how to get out of it. So I liked that element of it. I liked it that we had a younger cast, really talented group of actors. And also, once you get into the hospital, it becomes a John Carpenter movie, you know, where you see the glowing eyes coming out of the out of out of the darkness it was genuinely scary. And and I I was channeling my my inner John Carpenter for that episode. You know, skeletons in the closet. Again, you know, when when we did season two, the funny thing about that episode or that season was there was a lot of stories that were very personal to me. Skeletons in the closet is really really personal to me. I mean, I. I'm a I'm a horror fan. I'm a prop collector. You know, I remember hearing the stories. That's all. By the way, Skeletons in the Closet is based on a true story. You know, the the fact that they found a skeleton in a costume shop outside of Pittsburgh that was a real skeleton that was used in Dawn of the Dead. That's a true story. That really happened. So I always loved uh, when. I got hired by Tom Savini on Day of the Dead in 1984. My first job was call a medical supply place and start ordering skeletons. And we found out that all of the skeletons came from overseas, but they were real skeletons. So I had always wanted to do a story about like, well, where do these skeletons come from and what happens with them? And the idea, you know, I think originally I was like thinking about this idea that somebody that would want to actually donate their skeleton to a movie so that they could be, because they were like, I want to be actor. And I ended up uh, landing on this idea that this prop collector is so obsessed with collecting props for movies that he actually digs up a skeleton that was used in a movie to put into his collection. So uh, John Esposito wrote that. So, you know, there's a lot of jokes, it, even, the, even the joke about, um, David Warner's decapitated head from the omen. Um, the thing that makes me laugh about that is I actually own that prop. So while I was while I was developing that story with John, an auction came up and I bought the head. So I said, wait a minute, what what is it about this fiberglass head that's so important? So I put a joke in there about it, like, oh babe. You lost David Warner's decapitated head. Oh, I'm so sorry. So there's a lot of, you know, I love the movie quips. I love the movie quotes. You know, James Raymar came in and I had worked with James a lot. And he also is a big movie fan. So he was like, dude, I'm in. Like, I'll do it. I'd love to play this part. So it, that, that episode in particular, aside from every movie reference and every uh instantaneous bit of what i love about movies and horror and prop collecting and then of course we have the tribute the ultimate tribute to ray harryhausen which we have 
not only one skeleton, but at one point I was like, wait, we can't just have one skeleton. We need two skeletons because they have to sword fight. So it starts with Seventh Void, just Seventh Void, just Sinbad. And then we get a little Jason and the Argonauts. And I actually mimicked, um, I actually mimicked shots from Seventh Void, just Sinbad, because I wanted the audience to see what an impact uh, Ray Harryhausen's work had on me and so many people. So, you know, Creepshow is just a constant way for me to remind people um, the spirit of inspiration and, and passion. And that episode it was intended to be complete fun. I got to recreate the psycho uh, shower scene. I got to recreate the scene from The Shining. It, it just, I, I really felt like that was like the perfect film school episode for me to direct and to, to co-write. So I, I really had a great time with it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously you, can sort of, you can tell that and as a, as a fellow, you know, film, film buff and, and you know, collection things, you know, it does sort of, does sort of speak to speak to that audience. I mean, I'm guessing that you, know, you must have quite the, uh, the impressive memorabilia collection given the, the things that you've worked on. You know, do you have any uh, particular favorites? Uh, well, I have, I do have the original crate from Creepshow that has all the blood on it. Um, I have, I have some props from, you know, like a lot of the stuff was, you know, I have some props from Logan's Run. There's a lot of props that I have from movies that I worked on. Like I still have one of the ears from Reservoir Dogs um, that Mike Madsen cuts off and walks through, uh, walks through the frame with, you know, I have the stunt Freddy Krueger glove from the original movie the original nightmare it's got like plastic blades and plastic things and and you know if you played around with it for five minutes it would probably break but i have pictures of robert anglin and heather langenkamp and he's wearing that glove and it's just something cool about the fact that i i have that piece of history it sort of connects me to it in in a way that that um fulfills a lot of what i love you know and I mean, I guess sort of, um, you know, the show isn't afraid to mix things up in terms of in terms of format. I mean, one of my favorite episodes is the is the animated Halloween special, and um, you know, Survivor type. But that's one of my favorite Stephen King stories. And um, you know, are you guys hoping to to do some more uh, more animation episodes? Yes, as a matter of fact, we're doing we're doing another animation episode that'll be part of season three. That was uh, it's a really great story by Daniel Krauss and I called uh, the things in Oakwood's past. And it's about, and the, uh, we got Danielle Harris, uh, we got Ron Livingston and Mark Hamill are doing the voices. So we, I know I, I, I met Mark, uh, a, God, 20, 25 years ago. And we just did the recording session with him. So I was really excited to get a chance to work with them. And it's about this town, this small New England town that finds a time capsule buried in the ground and they're gonna make a big deal out of opening it. But you know, the mystery surrounding what's in it, who put it there. So it's got, you know, it's got a really kind of fun vibe to it. So uh, the, and the animation style will be a little different than what we did with Survivor Type because Survivor Type, we leaned into kind of the, motion graphic comic book style. Um, but I thought if we're gonna do another animated episode, let's change up the style of the animation. So this is a, a little more traditional in terms of the animation style. And, and uh, we're literally putting the finishing touches on it um, as we speak, so. And I guess that's my, my final question. You know, I can't, can't have you uh, here and you know, not mention you know, The Walking Dead. You've been involved with the show since, you know, since its its beginnings. It's you know, it's now entering its its end game phase. You know, and how are you feeling about sort of, you know, moving on from from this chapter? It's uh, it's strange, you know. It's 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 a weird, it's weird to think that you know these people that I have been with, you know, I got hired a year before the show ever even went into production. So I've been on The Walking Dead for twelve years. You know, I mean knowing Andy and watching his children grow up and the actresses on the show that got married, that had babies, you know, Christian and Sonequa and Alana. It, it's just strange to, to, to look at this family of people that we've been around and watch them grow and, 
evolve. So I feel like as we get closer to the end, it's going to really, uh, it's, it's going to be a hard to say goodbye, but knowing that these people that I've been in the trenches with, you know, it's an experience that you can't share with anyone else because no one was there. You know, Quentin told me when we did Inglorious Bastards, he had said, there's nothing that you can ever share with someone that wasn't there with you in the trenches. And I feel like I'm, I'm honored and, and delighted, you know, way back with Jeff DeMunn and Sarah Callies and John Bernthal and um, just the caliber of talent that, that we've had on the show, thanks to Frank Darabont's brilliant casting and fantastic writing. Uh, and I'm really, I, I, I don't know, man, like the, I'll be probably crying the last two weeks uh, straight, just trying to sort of process this part of my life going away it's it's i don't i can't imagine it well i'm uh, looking forward to see what you guys have what you guys have cooked up i've been watching it since uh day dot so i'm uh, looking forward to that and uh thank you. To see the uh, rest of uh, season three of the future thank you